Good morning, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning for Winship Grand Round. Um, if you are an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive CME uh, credit hours for attending uh, today, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note via the chat feature. This morning, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Kera. Dr. Kera is an Associate Professor of Medicine at, uh, at Mayo Clinic um, in Arizona. Uh, she treats patients with hematologic malignancies and uh, some solid tumors, especially those needing bone marrow transplant. Um, her research focuses on improving the delivery of care of patients with cancer to help them be better prepared for the psychosocial and financial consequences of the treatment. She has published several papers in, on outcomes, um, late effects, and quality of care uh, uh, in cancer patients and provide mentorship to trainees uh, interested in projects in these areas. She teaches classes as part of the high value cost conscious care uh, curriculum at Mayo Clinic uh, Medical School. Uh, she has held leadership positions at various committees and organizations, societies um, uh, in hematology and bone marrow transplant. Um, we are looking forward to listen to her uh, uh, presentation at the financial hardships for cancer treatment. And welcome, Dr. Kara. Thank you, Dr. Sharp, for the introduction. I am delighted to be here virtually today um, to present before you on this topic. Uh, I have no disclosures. I would like to start by sharing a story that I heard from one of the um, social workers uh, focus group that we had done as part of a study. Um, she talked about a multiple myeloma patient who was progressing and, had, and needing to go on a fifth line treatment. Um, when the patient, uh, when the oncologist had a talk with the patient and his wife about this, they said they wanted some time to think about it. And when they came back, they said they did not want to continue treatment. When asked why, they said when they had started the myeloma treatment, they had 30,000 in their bank account and they had decided at that time that once that went down to 10,000, that they would stop because he didn't want to leave his wife without any resources. So this story made me reflect on this quote by Dr. Shilsky that I had read some time before. He said, our goal as doctors is to provide our patients with the best medicine possible based on the best science available, but the cost of care is starting to creep into the exam room and affect the treatment decisions that we make with our patients. And that is what financial hardship or financial toxicity about. So over the next 40 minutes or so, I would like to talk to you about describing the problem of financial hardship of cancer treatment, also known as financial toxicity. Uh, I'd like to summarize the challenges and key knowledge gaps in our understanding of the problem. Uh, I'd list the stakeholders in the process of addressing financial hardship of cancer treatment. And finally, I would like to highlight some of the studies that have started to emerge with interventions and some policy initiatives that are hoping to address this problem for our patients. So just starting with what is financial toxicity or financial hardship? It is the unintended but not unanticipated objective financial burden and subjective financial distress experienced by patients with cancer as a result of their treatment that may increase the morbidity and mortality associated with the treatment. You will hear terms such as financial burden, financial distress, lack of socioeconomic uh, or financial well being, which have all been used interchangeably with financial toxicity and hardship. So if you ran a search on financial toxicity in PubMed, this is what you would see. There's about 25,000 results, but as I show you, most of these are studies that have been done in the last decade or so. So why is this becoming um, uh, such a common and important problem? I think there's two reasons for that. The first one is the increasing proportion of healthcare spending as a part of the, as a whole uh, of the household income. 
The graph on the left is some modeling estimates from a group. And basically what they show here is the black line is the household income. The dark, the light gray line is the 50% of household income. And the dark gray line is the employee premiums and out of pocket costs. And what they reported was that if the current trends continue, then by 2042, the median household income and the employee premiums and out of pocket costs will be equal, which is obviously not sustainable. You have to eat, you have to do other things with your income, not just spend it on healthcare. Um, more recently, there is um, some data using the medical expenditure panel survey that has also showed some similar findings that the, um, the proportion of uh, the uh, premiums and out-of-pocket costs that patients uh, or uh, popu the population spends as part of the household income has continued to increase from 7.8% in 2008 to 11.7% in 2017. More recently, this group um, did use multiple surveys to also uh, look at this uh, phenomena and basically showed that the per capita payment as a percent of income is about 18.7% currently and an absolute amount of 93, almost $9,300 over the year. Interestingly, these vary by primary insurance status, by household income and by age. And not surprisingly, the brunt is borne by our patients who are in the lower household income quintile, where this proportion is about 34% as opposed to 16% in the highest income quintile. So then the second thing that has also led to uh, this financial hardship emerging as an important problem, I feel, is the price of progress. These are two graphs from Dr. Peter Bach from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and they show us the monthly and median costs of cancer drugs at the time of FDA approval from 1965 to 2014. The one on the left is the absolute numbers, and the one on the right is a logarithmic transformation. And what it basically shows you that these costs have gone up exponentially um, since uh, since 1970s. And as you all know, cost sharing is an important component of our insurance system. And so it is very likely that part of these costs, increasing costs are being transferred to our patients and their families when they undergo treatment for their cancer. So you can, some of you may be wondering, why are you here today? This is all interesting, but how does it relate to you as a practitioner? Why do you, why should you care about it? Why should you know about it? And I would argue that we all as practitioners need to know about it because we need to know whether the medicine that we are prescribing for our patients is being able to be taken and is able to be afforded by our patients. Cost-related treatment non-adherence is an important part of financial toxicity. We know that it has an impact on patient's lifestyle, quality of life and mortality, and that is why we should, we should care about it. We know that it has started to impact and will worsen, continue to worsen in terms of access to innovative therapies that are very expensive. And finally, I think it is important to know because we can be the best advocates and leaders and work with policymakers to help make care more affordable and accessible, while at the same time providing the, the highest quality. So coming back, I hope I've been able to convince you to stay in this talk um, and know about financial hardship. So let's start by talking a little bit about what are some of the conceptual models. There are many that have been proposed. I like this one um, that was proposed by Dr. Robin Yabrov's group. And basically what it proposes is there are three domains to financial hardship. And the reason I like it is because it lends itself to interventions when you start thinking about developing um, interventions to target financial hardship. And what they propose is that the three domains are psychological response, which is the feeling of distress or worry or anxiety about costs of cancer care or concern about wages or income. Uh, material conditions, which is the more tangible things such as out-of-pocket expenses, missed work, reduced or lost income, medical debt or bankruptcy, and coping behaviors, which is the healthcare behaviors that our patients sometimes will um, start 
uh, start behaving because they are under pressure from the costs of treatment. And this could look like uh, less or skip medications, delaying or missing physician visits and so forth. What about the prevalence of financial hardship? The prevalence rates of financial burden, of financial hardship in cancer studies ranges from 12 to 18, 80%. And this is such a wide range because different studies have used different uh, definitions of financial hardship. Um, they have been done in different populations. Sometimes they have been done in a population setting, a population-based setting, such as through a national survey, or they are institutional and hence the wide range. However, most of these studies for good or for bad show that the severe financial burden um, indicated by bankruptcy ranges from 1.2 to 3% for our cancer patients. This is just hot off the press from Dr. Shankaran's group from University of Washington. And what they did was they merged the credit ratings with um, records from cancer, Washington State Cancer Registry and the Voter Registry to identify the adverse financial events in patients with cancer and control. And not surprisingly, again, they were able to show that even though the overall or the absolute percentage was not very high, our cancer patients do have higher incidence of adverse financial events, such as third party collections, charge offs, delinquent mortgage payments, as opposed to controls, which is the, the red bar and the cancer patients are the blue bar. Many of these descriptive studies have elucidated what are the predictors for financial hardship. Younger age is one, which is uh, again, um, kind of intuitive because younger patients may not have had time to build on their reserves. Um, they may have a younger household that they need to manage. Um, and then they don't have the safety net of Medicare. Uh, in specifically adult survivors of childhood cancers have been shown to be very, uh, a very vulnerable group when it comes to financial hardship. Um, lower household income, assets, loss of employment or productivity have, uh, again, surprisingly emerged to be as not surprisingly emerged to be as important predictors for financial hardship. Racial ethnic minority status is, is another factor, and that is because some of these groups are um, disproportionately uh, present in the, in the group, where, which is the less than 200% uh, of the federal poverty limit, and hence they have a higher likelihood of financial hardship. There are some disease and treatment related factors as well, such as advanced age cancers, um, underlying comorbidities, which increase overall expenses for our patients. Um, and finally, expensive medications, including costly medical technology, such as um, hematopoietic cell transplantation or CAR T cell therapy, which again, just being very, very expensive and because of the cost sharing aspect get transferred to the patient sometimes. So if you, if you think about it, most of these factors are non-modifiable as such. So we tried to think about what could be modifiable, uh, what could be a modifiable factor that we could then intervene based on. And so we looked at the association of health insurance literacy with financial hardship. And health insurance literacy is basically the ability to select and use optimally health insurance. And what we found was that patients who had lower health insurance literacy, as uh, shown by this light gray bar, had a higher incidence of um, financial hardship as opposed to those that had higher health insurance literacy. And this difference was mostly due to differences in the material hardship, which is, again, remember, bills, out-of-pocket costs, um, uh, and medical debt, um, and also behavioral hardship, which is how do the patients cope with, um, with the financial pressures. The psychological hardship was uh, not statistically significant between the, the two groups with high or low health insurance literacy. There cannot be a presentation in these times without talking about the pandemics as such. So um, Dr. Fiume Cochino and her group have looked at the pandemic related financial hardship by recruiting uh, patients from the young adult advocacy groups and uh, social media. And what they showed was that there is definitely a high prevalence of negative economic events and medical related cost coping behaviors. So they showed that um, patients are experiencing work disruptions due to childcare, decreased job security, decreased pay, 
job loss, loss of health insurance, and increased credit card debt, etc. Um, in the orange are what are some of the um, activities that they are doing as a result of these cost pressures. And um, as, as I mentioned before, not filling a prescription, putting off or postponing um, care such as mental health care or preventative care, um, or not seeing a specialist uh, or any provider at all. These are all the behaviors that again, got exacerbated because of the uh, impact of the pandemic, especially for our young adult patients. Insurance is, is an interesting factor. Uh, while a good insurance can be very protective uh, against financial hardship, lack of health insurance has been shown to be associated with catastrophic health expenditures and therefore increased likelihood of uh, financial hardship. Medicare offers a safety net for most, our, most of our uh, above 65 years of age patients. However, even in the Medicare population, um, there are factors uh, such as lack of supplemental insurance and Medicare Part D that can predispose to a higher financial hardship. Private insurance mostly is considered to be a good um, and a protective factor. However, again, there are nuances such as um, high deductible health plans without a health savings account or exchange plans um, that have the NCI cancer centers as out of network and therefore um, leave our patients with higher copays can be extremely distressing also when it comes to financial outcomes. So what are the consequences of financial hardship? Again, these descriptive studies that have been done have shown that um, there are lifestyle changes that our patients endorse, such as cutting back on leisure activities, reduced spending on utilities, food, um, using up savings, borrow, borrowing from family and friends, or selling, mortgaging their property possessions. I've had patients who've had to sell their vehicle to be able to continue um, to get medical care. And, and the most extreme form is obviously declaring bankruptcy. What is definitely more relevant to us as practicing uh, clinicians is treatment non-adherence, which is foregoing one or more medical service, skipping medication doses, or switching to alternatives that may be lower cost, but also lower efficacy, or refusing recommended treatment as that I described to you in the anecdote. Um, continuing with consequences, uh, again, these studies have shown that it impacts the quality of life adversely. There are um, higher incidences, higher uh, association with decreased physical and mental well-being, uh, greater depression and anxiety that is associated with financial hardship, poor satisfaction with cancer care, and a higher symptom burden. When it comes to impact on clinical outcomes, um, that is somewhat conflicting. So we did a small study with about 300 patients uh, where we, uh, this was in a transplant population and we were not able to show any association with mortality. However, I think that was because we used mild to moderate financial hardship as the definition of financial hardship in our study. When you start thinking in terms of the catastrophic outcomes like bankruptcy, Dr. Ramsey and his group has shown that these patients are at a higher risk for mortality. And how they did that was by, um, again, merging the, the data from the uh, bankruptcy records with the state cancer registry. And what they showed was patients with cancer um, that had filed for bankruptcy had a higher mortality with a hazard ratio of 1.79 than those who did not um, file for bankruptcy. So these descriptive studies have given us a wealth of information and has, um, again, started to move the field towards intervention. However, I feel there are still um, some knowledge gaps in addressing our financial hardship and hope that data will continue to emerge to be able to plug these gaps. The first is, what is the best time frame to discuss or address financial information with patients and caregivers? Do you do it right at the outset? Do you do it some time later? There are pros and cons to each of the approach, and um, sometimes it may depend on what the patient wants, but that is definitely something that we need more information about to be able to then implement some of the interventions at that time. 
We don't understand very well how does patient knowledge and use of insurance resources and financial assistance programs, how does that impact financial and health outcomes? Dr. Zafar's group from uh, Duke tried to look at that. However, uh, and I will show you that study um, later on, but they were not able to actually get definitive results because of a lot of challenges in conducting that study. We don't understand very well how does the how does the physician involvement in financial discussions on financial outcomes how, how does it impact? Um, there are many descriptive studies, however, they have not been able to correlate that to the financial outcomes for the for the patients. We don't understand long term impact of financial hardship on quality of life. We don't understand how the Diff, how the patient reported financial burden may be different across centers that may have varied resources and interventions to be able to assist these patients. And finally, we don't, we have some studies, but not very many that talk about financial hardship at the end of life or for our bereaved caregivers. So that is, uh, again, an area that is ripe for more, um, uh, more studies and more information. So do we leave individual patients to wrestle with the skyrocketing costs of cancer care and provide treatment determined by their ability to pay? Or do we intervene? And so what are some of these interventions that can help mitigate financial hardship is the next part of my talk. Before we go on to interventions, it is important to understand who are the main stakeholders in this, in this process of trying to address financial hardship. At the center, obviously, is the patient and the caregiver. And remember, it is not just the patient. The financial toxicity affects the whole household. Um, so we have to be able to include patients, caregivers, and even their family as, as the unit of study when we are trying to come up with studies to uh, look at the interventions. Healthcare providers and researchers, um, and then healthcare system, including hospitals, pharma, and finally, regulators such as payers and the federal government. These are the main stakeholders. So when we think about intervention, the first step obviously has to be screening. How do we even identify who is at risk for financial hardship? I was very fortunate to discuss this idea with Dr. Jimmy Holland, um, late Jimmy Holland, who is the pioneer in distress screening. And we talked a little bit about if we should say that there should be universal screening for financial distress. And this was a, a perspective piece that we uh, did in cancer. And what we proposed was that, yes, there is a need for universal screening for financial distress because we know that is associated with negative outcomes. We know that it is prevalent, even if it's somewhere in between 12 to 80 percent, that is still a sizable population that is being affected. We know that is it's often unrecognized by providers, and it's not so much unrecognized as it um, just gets lost in the in the small uh, time that we have um, to uh, during the clinical encounter with our cancer patients who are otherwise very complicated medically too. And then it's not treatable in the sense there is no drug that you can use. However, as I will show you, there are interventions that can be done to at least try and mitigate the effect of financial hardship for our patients. And why we recommend universal screening is because I think that would help avoid the stigma associated with such discussions, as has been reported by various um, patient focus groups that have been done in the studies. So screening can be done at the institutional level using a multitude of tools. Which one is the best? I don't know. Um, different institutions have uh, been using different measures. Um, but for, for providers as such, there's just two small questions that could help screen for financial harm while they are with the patient. Are you worried about how your medical care will be paid for? or are you having trouble paying for your medications at home can then help you tease out if the patient is really at risk for uh, worse financial outcomes and you can then plug them in with resources and assistance early on so that um, you can help overcome some of those issues. So uh, the first I wanna talk about is the patient targeting interventions to address financial distress. Um, these can include educational interventions or counseling. Um, these can include financial navigation or assistance programs. 
Um, so these are still um, mostly pilot studies, but they are starting to show some nice data. So I'll start by this educational intervention. This is a project that we did where we did interviews with patients and caregivers, and we did focus groups with social workers, case managers, and patient financial services. And this was to identify the main domains and the content for an educational intervention targeting financial hardship. And the, the goal of that project was how can we do better in addressing informational, emotional, and instrumental needs around financial hardship. So I'm very proud to say that based on this study, we have actually been able to develop uh, modules that will be delivered in a virtual classroom starting next month. Um, and these are uh, three different uh, sections. Uh, there's financial health planning, there's a module about employment co concerns, and there's a module about medical insurance. And patients will be invited to, to join these virtual classrooms and um, they can look at these presentations and then uh, at the end, what we want them to complete is this checklist. And this checklist, again, was derived by um, the qualitative uh, data that we had. And we thought that these are some of the questions that could indicate some of the red flags that, that might be happening, which we are not recognizing in time. And so once the patient completes this checklist, um, the social worker and the um, PFS representative who do the, the uh, who delivered the class are going to go over these and then help uh, assist the patient by uh, setting up one-to-one -one, uh, interactions with them so that they can delve deeper in their problem and help them. Um, for financial navigation programs, a combination of strategies has been um, looked at. Um, there are uh, groups that have looked at education, financial assistance screening, and an estimation tool for out-of-pocket cost. Um, Dr. Shankaran's group has looked at education and monthly contact with a financial counselor. That's a third party financial counselor and a case manager. And the main goals of these studies have, have, has been to improve knowledge about treatment costs, to provide financial counseling, to help manage out of pocket expenses, to decrease self-reported financial hardship and anxiety, and to improve health related quality of life. Another angle that some investigators have taken to address this problem is looking at it through the lens of social determinants of health. And social determinants of health, as some of you may know, are the conditions in which a person is born, they live, um, and they age. And now we know that there is an obvious association of social determinants of health with health outcomes um, for, for uh, the general population. So what these investigators have tried to do is create this um, measure called household material hardship, which is a combination of of lack of energy security, housing security, and food security, which are all closely interrelated with the financial health. And based on that, they have been able to do some studies. And the first one that I want to highlight here is from Dr. Nip and Dr. Moyes group from Boston. They did an equity intervention. This was, again, a pilot study, an equity intervention to address financial burden of clinical trial participation. So we all know that um, financial aspects can sometimes be big barriers for clinical trial enrollments. And so they tried to um, see if their pilot um, showed that this could be then addressed. So what they did was um, patients who, who were enrolled on a cancer clinical trial were referred to the intervention um, group if they expressed financial concerns or if the clinical team felt that they may benefit from participating in the study on the intervention arm. And so what the intervention actually was that um, once the patient paid out of pocket for clinical trial related travel and lodging costs, they were then given reimbursement um, for, for these. And after they submitted the receipts for um, these, these travel and lodging costs. And on the right is the, the, the results. Um, so the yellow bar is the, is the concern about cost of travel and cost of lodging uh, in the intervention patients. And as you can see that this went down from 41% at baseline to 32% at day 45 of clinical trial enrollment and 31% at day 90. On the other hand, the blue bar 
agreed that they, it was much less than the intervention group. But remember, that was one of the inclusion criteria is that the patients had to be financially distressed somehow. And so in, in the blue group, which is the comparison group, the concern about both cost of travel and cost of lodging increased from baseline 6.8% to 12.8% and 8% at day 45 and day 90, respectively. And similarly, for, for the cost of lodging, um, similar results were seen. The other um, group that has looked at is Dr. Kira Boner's group from Boston also. They did a small pilot for with nine patients, um, which they had quantitative and qualitative methods. And what they did was again, create an intervention um, that helped provide uh, transportation um, and groceries to pediatric oncology families. And since it was just nine patients, the quantitative data is not very definitive. However, the qualitative data did um, uh, show that patients, uh, the participants uh, reported high satisfaction, peace of mind, um, decreased worry and reduced stress. And in fact, they, most of them mentioned that the intervention period should have been longer than, than three months. So here is the randomized control trial. As I mentioned, Dr. Zafar's group has tried to look at patient knowledge and patient assistance programs and how that impacts out-of-pocket costs and financial hardship as such. So they created this mobile app called Bridge. Um, this was developed by Viver. Um, Viver, if sometimes they come at ASCO um, in the exhibit hall. So I don't know if anyone's ever met them, but they are a small healthcare technology company that has a patient financial assistance platform. Um, and basically they're, um, what they say is that they are able to in real time connect patients in need to the resources uh, or the assistance programs um, that would benefit them. And so with the help of this app, what they were hoping to see is the impact on out-of-pocket costs. Unfortunately, um, they were unable to directly assess the effect on out-of-pocket costs because of um, high trial attrition and missing follow-up survey data. They did do an exploratory post hoc analysis where they showed that patients who were on the intervention arm, which is that they were using this mobile app um, had a higher likelihood of applying for assistance programs as opposed to the ones that were on the control arm. But this was again a post hoc analysis. So um, the nice thing that they did is they uh, identified challenges and learning points for people who want to continue to study these, um, uh, these patients and these issues. And the first thing that they note is that outcome selection is very important. And this is, what's, this is something that I have struggled with also um, during my studies, because when you think about it, there may be interventions that may actually positively influence maybe one or two domains of the financial hardship, but actually may worsen the other. So for instance, the educational intervention, and we are looking into, uh, our, we have an ongoing project looking into this is, how does it really impact all these three different domains? What we hypothesize is that the educational intervention will help with the material and the coping behaviors, um, but it may not actually change much in terms of psychologic hardship uh, as, as was shown by our um, data with the health insurance literacy and association with financial hardship. The second thing that they uh, felt was because of the sensitive nature of questions, it was hard to do a longitudinal study. And again, these are sick patients, so we lo lose a lot of patients. There's a, there's a lot of attrition um, because of these patients becoming sick enough to not be able to answer survey questions or um, uh, patient reported or provide patient reported data. So the third thing that they, um, they advocate for is that we need to think of supplementing the patient reported data data by either looking at administrative databases or institutional databases um, to be able to uh, have uh, some definitive results. So next, I wanted to move towards provider targeting studies. And um, most of these studies have been descriptive in nature and not they don't really look at how some of these things 
translate into improving the financial hardship for the patient. Um, studies have looked at frequency, timing, and nature of cost discussions in communication about cost of care. Um, they have looked at uh, physician attitudes towards cost of care discussions or perceptions about decision aids that can help with shared decision making. They have looked at understanding and improving clinical workflows that are related to cost of care interventions, uh, co conversations, and identify potential barriers. But as I mentioned, the one main gap is they have not been able to link them to um, how that impacts the patient reported outcome for financial hardship. Um, the last is the health system targeting studies. And um, that's where, uh, again, mostly have been descriptive, um, looking at the financial hardship screening and management practices, care delivery and staffing models, um, looking at perceived barriers in implementation and leadership attitudes towards um, the screening and management practices. And so we did this study with the NCCN Best Practices Committee, where we surveyed NCCN centers and the barriers that emerged um, as important from our study included inadequate staffing, real-time resources, um, limited institutional budget, poor or no reimbursement for such services, clinical time constraints, um, lack of effective uh, risk mitigation strategies, and patients not interested. Um, the study that Dr. Janet DeMoor did with the NCI designated cancer centers identified somewhat similar barriers. And in addition, they also showed lack of awareness in the staff about some of these measures was an important barrier. Um, we are in the process of doing more studies that are trying to leverage um, our uh, electronic medical record, EPIC, um, that can help automate the process for screening, identifying the at-risk patients, and then being able to um, plug them with care pathways, plug them on care pathways that can then help address uh, their financial hardship. Um, this was another nicely done um, pilot study from Dr. Raghavan and Dr. Knight from Atrium Health. And they basically propose a multidisciplinary conference for a broad problem solving approach to financial toxicity. So something like a financial tumor board. Um, they included uh, representatives from pharmacy, nursing, social work, um, operational leadership, senior administration, financial counseling, revenue cycle, legal, and obviously the oncology providers. And what they showed was that by identifying problems, which included um, uninsured or underinsured patients, spare impediments, um, coding complexities, uh, pre-cert processes, and inadequate internal processes, they were able to show a, a saving of 55 to 60 million uh, of personal expenditure for more than 1,500 patients. And they were also able to uh, provide 1.3 million copay assistance for financially challenged patients as a result of this tumor board. So again, uh, it's, it's creative out of box kind of thinking um, and similar models may not be applicable to all practices, but they could definitely be adapted to whatever works for, um, for a practice or a center. Um, before I end, I just wanted to highlight some of the policy initiatives that, that are targeting financial hardship. I think the policy environment is very much keeping pace with some of these other interventions uh, in trying to make it easier or, for our patients to get high quality, affordable care. Um, the first one is accelerating transition to, to value-based care um, through some of the CMS measures. Um, encouraging adoption of telehealth and home-based care. Again, the pandemic has helped accelerate that. And by providing uh, equal reimbursement, um, uh, we have been able to uh, uh, improve the adoption of these services. We are uh, in a project looking at how is this being perceived in terms of improving the um, travel um, or avoiding costs of travel lodging for our patients uh, that are coming from a distance and can avoid that with a telehealth visit. Um, the No Surprises Act um, ha helps provide protection against surprise bills. So like for emergency room visits or for out of network costs that then can be uh, uh, treated as equivalent to in network costs. So that hopefully will help um, with our patients uh, not having bills that they have to worry about. Uh, and finally, CMS rules about improving transparency and oversight of uh, prescription drug and medical costs by publishing that data, um, especially for 
the uh, Medicare Part D beneficiaries, um, there are uh, there is a rule that is coming up. Uh, I think will be applicable uh, in January 2023 that will help reduce their out-of-pocket costs and improve price transparency and market competition in the Part D program. So all these measures hopefully will have um, some beneficial effect to uh, financial hardship for our patients. So to summarize, um, patient reported financial hardship from treatment is a growing challenge. Um, prevalence of financial hardship is likely to increase due to increasing prevalence of multiple chronic conditions, higher patient cost sharing, and higher costs of healthcare overall. Um, the main steps that we can take to address this include um, continuing to promote out-of-pocket costs and payment transparency, providing training to the clinicians um, to be able to help them address patient affordability concerns, um, creating clinical and financial pathways to address affordability and trying to make them automated so as uh, to make it more efficient. And finally, care delivery by lower cost, high quality sites of care and care teams. With that, I would like to end with this quote from Dr. Lee Newcomer, although I did add the, the wording in the parenthesis. There cannot be a celebration of discoveries if there is no way to pay for them or if they lead to our patients becoming bankrupt or homeless. Here are my acknowledgements. Um, my mentors, Joan Griffin and Stephanie Lee from Fred Hutch, and um, the others are my collaborators. Um, I also was an alumnus uh, of the Cohen Health Care Delivery Scholar Program, and uh, my funding for the projects has been internal uh, Mayo funding through Predolan and Eagles Foundation. And then I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Keda. <clears throat> if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature located on the bottom of your screen. Um, while we are waiting for questions, I wanted to mention that there is uh, there's no grand round lecture, uh, but we will return on uh, February 9th. So I think next week there is no grand round lecture with the, with the Emily's own uh, Gelari uh, Sadi who will be presenting financial toxicity, also a, a, health, uh, a health equity issue uh, impacting uh, patient care. Uh, to view the upcoming uh, Winship Grand Round lectures, uh, please visit the Grand Round uh, page at Winship Cancer Center uh, website or the Winship calendar. Uh, Dr. Kera, I want to ask you two questions. I want to take advantage of uh, me, pre me introducing uh, this uh, grand round. Uh, question number one, uh, we published a paper on, uh, on uh, pancreatic cancer fear Medicare, and we've showed that 70% of patients who are elderly above 65 uh, were not treated for a localized cancer. Uh, these patients have Medicaid, but they mm -hmm. don't have access to care. Uh, that's uh, one one problem, and we propose some issues. This one can answer these uh, these questions, uh, like uh, like access to okay. care. Uh, question number two is: Do you think drug pricing is the major issue, where we are practicing value-based care, but the cost sharing? Uh, model is not uh, is not applied specifically for drugs like uh, like let's say Harvoni, where they base the drug price on on the prevention of the disease, the cost of the prevention of the disease. Which what I mean is like liver transplant and uh, and uh, and liver cancer, and they 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 matched how much it will cost preventatively to price the drug. Would you think that this needs to be regulated? Absolutely. So uh, let me start by um, going over your second question, which is, uh, you know, the drug pricing and value-based care. Uh, I totally agree that, you know, even though we've started to move towards that, we are still not seeing very much um, difference being made. Um, and partly that is because the, the drug prices are really, really high. So definitely 
trying to address that at some level. And I know this is more of a political debate about whether Medicare should or should not regulate drug prices, um, because that definitely will ha have an impact on the cost sharing aspect for, for our patients. I think that's important. Um, one of the possible um, solutions that has been also proposed is that we, we develop these tiers and and some of them some of the insurance companies are already doing that where they have this tiered approach where um, treatments that are high value actually have lower cost sharing versus treatments with um, low value that are not really improving the clinical outcomes much have a much higher cost sharing so that the patient has more skin in the game if they decide to get that um, so, so that is definitely something that we need to continue to work on. Um, your point about uh, the preventative aspect that even though it may be expensive, but then it can prevent more downstream costs is, is, is important. But I think the struggle there is when you start looking at population-based um, uh, costs, if you were to try and do that on a more large scale, um, how would that impact? And I, I had heard a nice talk where there was a very creative solution that was proposed, which is that the government should just buy um, some of those medications that may be, uh, you know, good for prevention of cancer, um, even though they are very expensive, but then they can actually help even out the long-term costs that, uh, so like with hep C, you know, patients if they are being treated appropriately will not develop liver cancer. So um, definitely something that I think uh, the policy uh, field needs to continue to move towards to address this problem. The access to care with the Medicaid, um, that again is an important challenge. The Affordable Care Act did have some provisions, um, but not all states expanded Medicaid um, uh, with that. And even otherwise, I mean, Medicaid, I, I think it's very state dependent based on the provisions. I can only speak for my transplant, uh, hematopoietic cell transplant population, where the, the benefit packages for Medicaid are very different based on the state that you belong to, and therefore may or may not predispose patients to financial hardship. Um, again, I think that's a, that's a solution that's more politically motivated than um, at, at an individual level that we can address, but definitely improving, uh, not just expanding Medicaid, but also improving um, the delivery of care through Medicaid by, by expanding their benefits package, I think will help uh, overcome some of the problems with access for our Medicaid patients. Um, but that is, that is again, a problem that um, probably is uh, beyond just pancreatic cancer. I think um, you will see it in most other cancers, uh, some limited access with, with Medicaid. So I hope that answered your questions. Yes, thank you. And there was a paper two months ago about Medicaid expansion and cancer screening and uh, breast, colon, and prostate, uh, which showed that Medicaid expansion has helped. Has helped, yeah. Um, I have, first I have one great talk and uh, I have a question in Q&A, Dr. Lawson. As I understand, up to a quarter of our patients live alone. Is this a group that warrants closer attention? Absolutely. So um, uh, what I didn't show you, because it's still a process, um, an ongoing uh, work, is we have data on about 30,000 patients who answered a financial hardship question in EPIC. And so that made us look very carefully at some of these sociodemographic uh, factors that are associated with financial hardship, even for a population that's coming to Mayo. And, and I, I don't know about you guys, but we do have a little bit of an elite population. And so even in our population, we found about 10 to 14% incidence of financial hardship. And the single patients, when we looked at um, single versus, uh, actually we clubbed single divorced um, patients with, and we compared them to married patients, and we did find a higher incidence, a uh, higher likelihood of reporting financial hardship for, for patients who live alone. Um, so definitely that is a group that is considered so somewhat at risk when you think of screening um, these people. Dr. Shab, do you want me to take the questions that are coming up in Q and A, or? I'm only seeing. Uh, uh, okay, now I see. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for the nice overview. 
a financial uh, financial health probably. You haven't addressed the drivers of cost. Uh, yeah, pharma is one of the most profitable. Like yeah, we we asked this question, but you can maybe elaborate more. What what do you propose to limit cost drivers? Mark Cuban Pharmacy uh, announced affordable drug price Glivec at $17. Do you think this is sustainable and also expandable to many cancer drugs? And the third question, what option do we have for patients who do not have insurance? So basically, uh, pharma, uh, Glivec at subsidized cost, and, uh, and the options for patients who don't have insurance. Um, sure. So, um, Dr. Waller, thank you for bringing that up. I think that is um, the biggest challenge for our healthcare. Me and my husband, we, we you know, fight all the time. And I am so pessimistic that this is not going to be able to be changed in our lifetimes. And he's like, no, you know, there are big companies that are coming up that are going to help um, put this to change. However, I think um, the, the thing that I want to highlight here is Yes, bending the cost curve will help, but we actually have a project where we looked at the correlation of healthcare uh, or system level costs with patient level costs uh, using database from Optum. And we didn't find a correlation. And that is probably because of the different benefit um, plans that patients have. So yes, I agree. While it is very, very important to limit the cost drivers by bending the cost curve overall, um, I am not 100% sure how that is. I mean, it will eventually decrease cost sharing for everyone, but it, it may not impact the, the, the lowest group or the most vulnerable group still. Um, as far as uh, pharma being most profitable, doctors being highest paid, I attended a very nice debate at one of the uh, academy um, meetings which was uh, um, uh, by Dr. Ashish Jha from Brown. And he basically asked the, the room as to how many patients are ready to take a cut in their salary to be able to drive the cost curve down. And I can tell you, no one raised their hands because the issue was people said, we spend so much money, we have so much loans, why should we not enjoy uh, you know, the hard work that we have put in. So I think that is a much difficult problem to solve um, in terms of being able to um, limit the cost drivers, but definitely there are efforts that are on, especially at the policy level that I think will make things a little bit easier, um, but may not completely resolve the problem. Um, hope that was <laughs> okay for um, what you were hoping to hear. Um, as for the Gleevec prices, um, definitely I think that is a uh, that is a big uh, win for uh, for those of us who are uh, working towards making things better for our patients with respect to financial hardship. I do think this is sustainable, although again, this will need to be looked at. Uh, again, I had attended a nice talk where they where um, the pharma company shared as to how they actually decide their prices. And that is based a little bit on um, not only the costs that go in the R&D for the drug, but also what kind of a uh, patient population they are targeting. So something for an, um, for an antihypertensive, which is going to be used by millions of people, um, the, cost, the costing is different than uh, some of our cancer drugs, which are for more limited number of patients. But again, I think, um, with, especially for the generics, um, having prices that are more in the affordable range will, will definitely help and should we should try to expand that to as many cancer drugs as possible. Um, and then I think there was another question uh, about how do you define insurance literacy? So the, the definition, so we use two different measures and one was the Kaiser survey, which is more about numeric literacy and asks people about how much um, deductible or how much copay do they think they will have. And then we used a health insurance literacy measure, which is more about um, how patients decide to uh, select and use um, insurance and more about attitudes and behaviors and confidence levels. So that's what we use for um, insurance literacy in, in our project. Um, and then there is one more question that I see, what option do we have for patients who do not have insurance? I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I think that is definitely the group that we struggle with the most because um, those patients get, uh, uh, they 
they get care at the highest possible prices because they don't have somebody that can negotiate for them to to be able to reduce the prices and so um, that is definitely uh, one of the biggest challenges and that's where again uh, you know policy measures that can help expand insurance access uh, will help but I also want to comment it's not just uninsurance it's also under insurance which um, definitely makes it very hard for our patients uh, and that is basically uh, again spending more on healthcare as a proportion of your uh, overall income um, that has continued to go up and that makes it hard for our patients also um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting uh, you know financially challenged so um, do you want me to take the last question? There is one more. Yes, sure. Sure. So, um, uh, have you been able to systematically roll out the patient financial distress screens in your prospective trials and evaluate the impact of interventions? Um, I am still struggling with what is the best screen. Um, so in my studies so far, we have used the cost facet measure, which is one of the main validated measure in our cancer um, populations. And so what I worry about that is that it does not lend itself to um, interventions in real time because you have to like calculate and you have to look at median and so forth. And so um, some of the other things we have used are the five questions from National Health Interview Survey. And they are good because they also are able to tease out the domain, whether it's material hardship or psychological or behavioral hardship. And those are the ones that I have started to use more and more. Um, and we plan to, especially for that educational intervention, uh, in terms of looking at the outcomes with that, that's what we are hoping to use um, for for outcome measurement. In addition, um, as I mentioned, outcome, selecting the outcome measure is very important because um, one thing the intervention may actually improve something. And so the other thing that I think is very important is anxiety about understanding costs, not just having financial hardship. And that is one other question that we have tried to include as a, as sort of a outcome measure, not, not really a screen, but uh, definitely looking at, at the impact of the interventions. I don't think we have any more. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I think this is a topic that uh, continues to be uh, an area of interest, and I think it should be incorporated on clinical trials, a prospective and uh, retrospective. We, we really don't know like what are the exact access to care issues. Uh, thank you for your talk. Thank you.